Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where in the world you might be right now. And welcome to another episode of Global Crisis, Global Solidarity, hosted by the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and streaming live from our offices in Berlin. Every first and third Wednesday of the month, we invite scholars, activists, politicians, and other partners of the foundation to develop a better understanding of the current economic and social crisis rocking our world, as well as to discuss what kind of answers an internationalist left needs to develop for today. My name is Lauren Bellhorn. I'm working as an editor here at the Stiftung, and joining me as always is Fida al -Zanin. If you'd like to be part of today's conversation, just drop us a line on YouTube or on Facebook in the chat box, and we'll do our best to include as many questions and comments from viewers uh, as we have time for. Today, we're uh, talking about Germany, the country that we live and work in, but don't actually get to discuss very often on the show. And specifically, we're talking about Germany's role in Europe, Germany's role in the world, and the foreign policy approach uh, that Germany takes on the world stage. For better or for worse, the Federal Republic enjoys a positive reputation uh, on the world stage. The country is noted for a stable democracy, for world-class industry and engineering, and, at least until fairly recently, what was widely considered to be a non-interventionist foreign policy, supporting disarmament and peace, and sticking to within its own borders. Uh, despite the fact that Germany has since become a leading arms exporter and is engaged in a growing number of military deployments around the world, Germany continues to be seen as a proponent of multilateralism and peaceful coexistence, as well as an opponent to uh, illegal foreign wars such as the 2003 uh, U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. We have a great guest to talk about this issue today. We're joined by Jan von Aachen. Jan is a member of the executive board of Die Linke, the left party in Germany, he also sat in the German parliament for Die Linke from 2009 to 2017 and is an expert on German foreign policy, on German arms sales. In fact, at one point, he was even a weapons inspector uh, for the United Nations and will be joining us to talk about to what extent Germany could be or could change to work as a force for peace in the world and what ideas for German foreign policy the left, both the party as well as the left as a broader formation, have to contribute to that concept. So Jan, first of all, thanks, thanks a lot for joining us today. Inviting me. Hi, Fida. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Jan. So let's start out with where Germany's at today. Uh, as of 2020, or as of earlier this year, a total of 3,189 German soldiers were involved in international operations in countries like Afghanistan, Mali, uh, Syria, and elsewhere. This might be fairly little compared to a country like the United States, but it's no small figure and certainly a big shift compared to the Cold War period when neither, Ger neither East nor West Germany had any troops stationed abroad. So what has changed in the last couple decades, Jan, and how would you describe Germany's current approach to foreign policy? Change you can see in my person. I grew up in West Germany. I was born in 1961. And so I grew up in, in a West German country where it was clear for everybody from left to right that there wouldn't be any German soldier from foreign soil. It, it was unthinkable and, and, and they didn't do it. Even um, after the reunification in 1990, when there was the first Iraq war, the, the Christian Democratic, the conservative chancellor would never even think about sending foreign troops to the Iraq war in 1990. It was a no-go. Uh, it was sort of one of the lessons learned from two world wars that were started by Germany, uh, sort of a peaceful, non-military non interventionist uh, foreign policy. And that changed in the years after reunification. And then it needed you know, the first, uh, what we call red-green government in, in, in federal Germany. So the Social Democrats and the Green Party started their coalition government in 98. And it didn't took even a year, I think, until they started the first war of, uh, with the involvement of German soldiers on foreign soil in Yugoslavia. This was really breaking a big taboo in Germany. And it was the Red Green government. Uh, I always have to think it's probably the same as, as they say in the US, only Nixon could go to China. You know, you needed a, a right winger to go to China to break this taboo. And you needed sort of the, the progressives in Germany to break the taboo with soldiers on foreign soil. And since 98, since this uh, breaking of the taboo, um, I think we saw more than a dozen um, military missions for the German army. Uh, the biggest one was Afghanistan. Now the biggest one is Mali. We have a couple of thousand soldiers. Um, 
So it becomes normality. And, and I have to say, I mean, as I grew up in this Western Germany, where, where it was a no-go, and nobody who would go at that time to the German army, army would even think about involvement in a war, um, then when I came to the, to the German parliament and the foreign committee in 2009, it was a shock to me to realize that this militaristic thinking took over totally. Everybody in that room, not those from the left party, but all the other parties, whatever, Social Democrats, Green Party, Christian Democrats, all of them were just thinking international problems in military terms. After, after a couple of years in this foreign com committee, I always had the saying, you know, um, I think it's a, it's a Chinese or an Asian proverb that says, for the man with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And for them, every international problem looks like a military problem, and they try to solve it either by sending weapons or soldiers or both. Maybe we can zoom in for a second on Mali. Um, as I think it's probably an operation that's it's at least less well known than, for example, what's going on um, in Afghanistan. So when Germany sends soldiers to a country like Mali, what is the official justification for the deployment? And what do you think are the underlying motives of the German foreign ministry or the German government when they engage in an operation like this? Start with a second question. The underlying problem was at that time it was support for France. I mean, there was no genuine foreign policy interest for Germany to send trips to Mali. It was a situation where France asked for help, asked for support, and they did it. And I, I was there in the, in the foreign committee, and um, it was clear that nobody there really liked the idea, but okay, France is our biggest buddy, uh, we have to support them, we do it. And the motive for the French was very clear. I mean, these were the uranium um, 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 mines in Niger. Um, so they saw their uranium source endangered by the civil unrest in, in Mali. And that's the only reason why they sent their soldiers and asked the Germans to support them. Um, usually in other conflicts in Africa, there could be civil unrest, there, there, there could be massacres whatsoever. And France or Germany or other European forces wouldn't care at all, only if their own interests are involved. And that was the case in Mali. So before we go into some other topics, I wanted to come back to um, when you started out by uh, saying you were born in West Germany in the 1960s. So I imagine that means uh, that you were right around the age uh, during reunification where a large part of the German left, um, and this is something that might surprise a lot of our viewers outside of Germany, it certainly surprised me when I moved to Germany and, and read about this, but that around 8990, uh, there was a very widespread discourse um, uh, among the German left, that the reunification of East and West Germany would also lead to something like a reemergence of German imperialism, that there was something about the German nation that couldn't help but become uh, hegemonic in Europe and maybe in the world. Um, so three decades down the line, uh, given the developments that you've just been talking about in German foreign policy, do you think that those critics turned out to be right? Was there something inherently reactionary about uh, the re-emergence of a German state on this, on the international stage? From the perspective within Germany, I would say yes, uh, it led to a rise in nationalism. Um, I still remember in 1990, there were the uh, World Cup, soccer World Cup, and you know, soccer is big in Germany, biggest thing you can think of. And at that time, it was for the first time that you would see a lot of German national flags in the streets. I have not seen them before in Germany. Whether there was a World Cup or not, they weren't there. Very minimal. And this changed. So, so it became more okay-ish in Germany to demonstrate your nationalism. So that, 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 that's one of the changes. On the international level, I see the danger. I don't trust this country. I mean, I live in Germany. Germany started two world wars. Uh, it, it's an inherently militaristic thinking country. So I don't trust my fellow country, men and women. Uh, and, and I think many, and not only lefties, liberals, even Christian Democrats, I think they have sort of this cautious approach to nationalism in Germany. Um, so um, one thing I learned, for example, only in, in the 2000s is that NATO was perceived by many NATO countries not only as a protection for themselves and also as a protection for Germany, but also as a protection from Germany. By reigning in Germany in the 50s and 60s into the NATO, 
uh, they thought they could be protected from a new big military mind in Germany. Everybody in Europe was afraid of Germany, and rightly so. So NATO was sort of in a way also to, to rein them in and not to have them at least against themselves. Um, this was it's a thinking that is still, you can see it, at least people 50 plus in, in German politics who, who follow this thinking. And I think also this, this priority list that you hear from every conservative and social democratic government all the time is first priority for Germany is European Union. Then comes nothing, nothing, nothing. Then comes NATO, and German interests are below that. And I think this is, in a way, true. It's not true when it comes to economics. Germans were always very good and follow their own economic interests everywhere in the world. Uh, they don't care about human rights. They care about the economics. They're doing well on that side. But I think most of German politicians would follow the line of let's rein in our own inherent military might thinking by being part of a greater union in Europe and in the NATO. Yes, um, I'd like to zoom out a little bit and move to another topic. As Lauren has mentioned before, you have spent many years working on German arms trade. So I'd like to know from you, or could you give us uh, an idea of how big it is and also what kind of weapons are being sold and who are the main buyers of those weapons? Interesting thing, because I mean, growing up in West Germany, there was always this peaceful picture I grew up with. And when I learned for the first time that Germany was the third biggest arms exporter in the world, only topped by the US and by Russia, I was shocked. And until today, if you go into the German street and tell people, hey, you guys, you are the third or fourth biggest arms exporter in the world, people wouldn't believe it. I mean, now it changed, but about 10 years ago, nobody would have known it. So, um, we, so when I um, came to parliament in 2009, we as a team started to work on German arms exports for the past 10 years. And um, it turns out that they sell weapons to nearly every country in the world and nearly every kind of weapon. I mean, it really goes from tanks to airplanes to small and light arms. Everything you can think of is sold by German companies to whoever wants it. I mean, there's very few restrictions. And I think the, the, the value is in Germany, it's about 8 billion euro a year is at least licensed in Germany as arms exports. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and what kind of weapons do they sell, like, usually? Everything. Um, I, I'm mostly concerned with the small arms and light weapons. Um, so small arms is what one to two soldiers can carry. So it's heavy machine um, guns, um, machine pistols, hand grenades, and so on. I think um, they are the most dangerous. I remember that Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General once called these small arms the weapons of mass destruction of our times, because most people in conflict in these days are called by small arms and light weapons. So we campaign mainly against these small arms. And one of the biggest um, small arms producer, um, producers in Germany is Heckler & Koch. Um, there were quite many scandals around Heckler & Koch, who I think, yeah, sent their weapons to whatever country wanted them. Yeah. So what's interesting is that uh, I read a recent study published by the Peace Research Institute in Frankfurt stated that Germany repeatedly violated the criteria of respecting the human rights uh, and international law uh, when it comes to arms sales. So how come or, or why aren't these criteria being enforced and what is needed to do so? It's a violation of criteria, but this is not the law. That's the problem in Germany. Yes, we have an arms export law, and that is pretty vague. And then the government gives themselves some rules. So it's not a law, but it's so self-abiding rules. And these rules, on the first time I read them, they sounded pretty tough. I mean, they talk about human rights. They talk about sustainability. What's, every nice word you want to hear is in there. But if you read it in detail, you realize it says, for example, just one example, it, it reads like, um, it is not allowed to sell weapons of war to countries outside of NATO and the EU. Comma, only in exceptional cases it might be that it's necessary for foreign policy purposes whatsoever. So it's in there as an exception, and the numbers show you that more than 60% of all weapons of wars are to countries outside EU and NATO. 
So the rules have loopholes and they are used by the companies. It's pretty simple. Yeah, and this leads me like to the next point. Like I've also seen this argument that we don't sell uh, weapons uh, where uh, those weapons could be used to violate human rights. And I'm mainly speaking of selling submarines to the military dictatorship in Egypt. And they argue that those submarines are not being used to suppress protests on the ground. So what do you think of such arguments? It's a very old German saying. I know the, the German foreign minister of the late 70s and early 80s, Genscher, the, the most famous German um, foreign secretary, once said in, in, in terms of arms exports, everything that's swimming goes. It means so every kind of boat, everything, yeah, cannon boats, frigates, whatsoever, uh, could be exported because they cannot be used for human rights violation. Um, there's a very simple counter argument. Look at Yemen today. I mean, Saudi Arabia and the coalition around Saudi Arabia, they have a sea blockade against Yemen. There's a hunger crisis in Yemen because there's no ship coming to Yemen to supply the people with food. And what do they use for a sea blockade? It's ships. So you can definitely also violate human rights with ships. So I think if you say no arms exports, it's also ships. Yeah, and you spent, um, like, we, like we mentioned, you spent eight years in the German parliament, uh, weapons sales, German foreign policy being your main focus. You mentioned just a second ago that uh, arms export laws are too lax. So what concretely, when you were a legislator, legislator rather, um, what kind of proposals were you making or what do you think, what kind of steps could the government take to restrict these kinds of sales, especially since the manufacturers are not the German state itself, but private corporations? it and I think the only solution is that you really change the whole system. Today the system works in Germany and most other countries like this. There's a company that wants to export a tank or, or a machine gun. They apply for a license at the German government and then the German government grants this license or not. Um, now we have between 10 to 12,000 applications every year. And from these 10 to 12,000 applications, only 100 are denied. So the whole system is set on go. Whatever so you apply for, you can be sure. corporations applying for permission to make weapons? And not to make also, but mainly also for export. You have to differentiate between weapons of war. So for weapons of war, you need a license for production, a license for transport, and a license for export. And for all the other arms, um, armament, uh, munition, ammunition, whatsoever, what, what's not a weapon of war, but what's part of an army, what's military uh, stuff like software, like uniforms, like night vision goggles, whatsoever, um, that's also, you need a license or a permission for export. Yeah. So the companies uh, apply and in every single case, the German government says yes or no, and in 99.9% .9 they say yes. So we realized the only way of stopping this, because this whole system, this single case by single case system is set on go, is that we need general um, denials. We have to say, for example, there is no export of small arms and light weapons anymore to no one, with no exception. As soon as you have exceptions, you will have you know, an, an outflow of billions of, of uh, weapons. That's what we see from this, what I said, you know, this, this um, piece of paper every German government every four years agrees on, which prohibits this sale of weapons of war to countries outside the EU, with a few exceptions, and at the end, you know, 60% is exported to these countries. So as soon as you leave an exception, it will go on. So I think we have to switch totally from this case-by-case -case decision to a general prohibition for at least special arms or category of arms. What I don't think is a solution is a list of countries. I mean, this is usually supported in Germany where they say, oh, human rights violators should not receive German weapons. Sounds good. But then if you say human rights violators, you have to make a list. You have to write a list where, for example, you say Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Cuba, and the US are not receiving German weapons. <laughs> so what I can guarantee you, whatever the government is, you have this list, Saudi Arabia will never ever be part of this list because Saudi Arabia is too important for Germany. 
and they don't want to be discriminatory. So they don't want to allow weapon exports to India, but not to Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia, they will probably invent like human right dialogues, human right movements, improvements whatsoever. So the real bad guys, what I think is real bad guys, will never end up on the list. The only countries on the list will be Cuba, North Korea, and then Iran and some other local countries. So it will not solve our problem. So it, while it sounds politically better to think about a, a list of bad countries, it's politically not advisable to go down this route, but better go for general prohibitions. Well, when we're going down the route of general prohibitions, what do we need an arms industry for to begin with? Do you see any, any argument yeah. for retaining sure. Heckler and Koch, for example? Um, I'm not talking about a specific company, and I mean, I would really throw a big party, when, once Corona is over, I would throw a big party effect on Koch goes down the sink or goes civil. I mean, we don't want them to go bankrupt, we want them to, to, to turn to civil production. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's our main goal, because we don't want to lose the, the, the jobs over there. Um, but yeah, the, your question was, do we need um, arms industry? Uh, the German left party says in the long run, you probably don't need a German army any longer. But for right, we are not advocating to dissolve the German army immediately. And as long as you have a German army, you need, would need some weapons for them. About 50% of the German arms industry uh, products is exported. The other 50% is for internal use, mostly German, German uh, military or the police forces. So what we suggest is to start with uh, the arms exports. And then in the long run, I mean, once we have solved some other problems, I think in 10, 20, 30 years, I can envision a Germany with no army. And then we don't need this arms industry at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, jobs. That's one more thing I wanted to ask you about um, before we move on to some other topics. Uh, do you have an idea of um, of how many jobs depend on the arms industry. Obviously, we have similar debates when we talk about uh, electromobility transitioning away from uh, the automotive industry is how many industrial jobs, and usually well-paying industrial jobs, uh, depend on this. Are we talking about tens of thousands of workers? I mean, this is a significant segment of the workforce. It's tens of thousands, but it's not significant. I mean, you're talking about Germany. And I mean, we only can guess the numbers because the industry always comes up with different numbers. But the most constant number I heard is that about 80,000 people in Germany depend on the arms industry, not working there, but depend on arms. So if you say 50% is export, so we're talking about 40,000 jobs. 40,000 jobs in Germany is not much. I still remember a couple of years ago, there was a, was a German um, um, retail um, chain, Schlecker, they, they went bankrupt overnight. And I think overnight, 30,000 something and people lost their jobs. Nobody cared for them. That's capitalism, you know, there, there's somebody goes bankrupt if people lose their jobs and they, they find other jobs. So only the left party at that time talked about the jobless women. It was mainly women working in these retail shops. No, none of the other parties cared about them. Now, the same number of jobs in the arms industry, it's all these conservatives who care about the job suddenly. The difference is here, I also care about the job. So I don't want them to lose the job to 40,000. I want their companies to change from military to civil production. Mm -hmm. And this lefty intervention, I mean, this thing, thinking is 2,000 years old. If you look at the Bible, uh, you have the saying there, um, Schwerter zu Flugscharen, which is words to plowshares. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's a Catholic Christian in, in, in invention. And I think it's a good idea, you know, just produce civil goods for the good of the people and not arms. Well, speaking of left interventions, that's, uh, that's a, maybe a good segue into the next topic we wanted to ask you about. Um, we want to talk more generally about foreign policy. And this is maybe uh, viewers uh, from abroad probably won't know um, some of the ins and outs of foreign policy debates uh, uh, on the German left or in Germany more generally. But suffice it to say, you are known in the party for advocating uh, something like a left foreign policy um, uh, going beyond uh, kind of a simple rejection of all foreign intervention. And I was wondering if you could, um, if you could talk about that for a bit. For example, you wrote a piece uh, for the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung about two years ago um, 
uh, trying to formulate what you call a left-wing uh, position on, on crisis prevention or civil crisis prevention. So can you just lay out for us a bit what, what you mean by that and how you maybe um, uh, divert or diverge from left orthodoxy a bit? Yeah, maybe you don't. Maybe I'm mischaracterizing. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not a political scientist. I'm a botanist by training. <laughs> this is how I came to the biological weapons and weapons inspector. Um, so, but I, I can't talk about, you know, the finesse of political sciences and, 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 and um, lefty orthodox position. What I can tell you, you know, I was shocked. You know, I came to Parliament. We talked about um, Afghanistan, about um, um, yeah, other military interventions of the German army. And when we voted as left against it, the other parties would always say, do you want to leave the people alone? So they made up this duality of either military intervention or you leave the people alone. And this is a, it's a trap. I mean, it's the wrong thinking. And I think what we have to say, and, and I always say it, and I think the majority of our party says it, as lefties, we are internationalists. And internationalists mean I do care if people in other countries are exploited, are tortured. Um, so yes, I do want to intervene. I'm not against intervention on the opposite. As an internationalist, I'm pro-intervention. The problem is that when I say intervention, I never think military intervention. When the other parties in Germany say intervention, they only mean military intervention. And I think this is the, the, the key difference. I think the German government relies a lot on what we call the export of violence, export of weapons, soldiers, in other countries, or also trade deals that are unjust and violate the rights of people in other countries. So they export violence, and we as lefties say we want to intervene by non-military means, by civil means, um, to help people in other countries, but never think this along military lines. Maybe this is a little, a little bit of a breaking with very old-style lefty thinking. Um, it was in, in some part of, of history of, of German activism also a thing of going uh, with military might into other countries. Think about 90 years ago, uh, support for the for the Republic in Spain. The fighters, thousands of fighters from all over the world went there to support the communist social anarchists in Spain. Um, or even 30 years ago, 40 years ago in Western Europe, they collected money donated for El Salvador for the for the progressive revolutionaries there to buy weapons. Of course, weapons for El Salvador were the campaign here. So the, there is also history in the left with military interventions, but for me personally, and, and for the party, the left here in Germany, and when we say intervention, it always means non-military. So, so as, a, as, a, as, a, as a small party, right? I mean, Die Linke has somewhere, depending on the election, somewhere between seven and 12% of the vote. Um, generally in the opposition, sometimes in individual states, in government. Um, what, can, what can a left party, uh, for lack of a better term, what can a protest party um, then really contribute in this debate? I mean, obviously, the left can't determine government policy. Um, it, can't, it can't alter the nature of a German uh, military deployment. So what do you think is the position of the left, or what is the role of the left then in these sorts of debates? First, I have to protest <laughs> on two grounds, Lauren. Lauren, size does not matter, never, <laughs> ever. <laughs> and secondly, I have to protest because we are not a protest party. Sure, I mean, I'm, I'm active in, in lefty politics for 40 years. I've been it's, in so many you know, barricades, buildings, and demonstrations whatsoever. But at the same time, I think we are also pretty constructive. And I also have to laugh now, because right now, um, you're calling me in the city of Erfurt, which is in the state of Thuringia in Germany, where the ruling party and the prime minister of Thuringia is from the left party. So um, it's, it's so we have, we have different um, ways. But in, in, on, on, the, on the general line, you're right, within Germany, um, on the federal level, we are opposition party. And it's amazing to see how much you really can do as an opposition party. Uh, I never thought that before, because you have to know, until 2007, I was never involved in any party politics. I was more on the radical left uh, on the streets, um, civil society movements, and only started with parties uh, 13 years ago. 
And I never thought that this, that it's such a, a small or an opposition party could have such an influence on German politics. One thing, for example, the arms exports, we talked about it. It was a total non-issue until 2009. Then at the same time, we as a party started to work on it in parliament. And we had a lot of civil society organizations in Germany who started to campaign. And I think together, and I think it's really 50-50 together, we changed completely in Germany. It's one of the big issues of German politics now, arms exports. And the same thing on, on uh, deployments on foreign soil for the German army. I think without the link in the, in the parliament, it would be a non-issue today. I mean, they would do it. They would send the, the military here and there. There would be very few protests. Nobody would care. It's because we always bring it up. We always uh, contradict it. We vote against it. Um, that it's not that easy also for the ruling party to do it on a, on a regular level. And I think there were a couple of instances where my gut feeling would say, if it was not for the left in the parliament, they would have sent soldiers here and there, but they knew the outcry would be too big. Um, so we cannot stop it in a way, but we really can rein it in and, and we can raise issues, and I think, pretty successfully. So if, if I'm saying today that I would think the German society is still anti-militaristic and very critical of arms exports and foreign deployments, it's to a large extent also because of the left party. Not only, there are others, but also to a large extent. I, I, th I think I would agree with you. Um, I guess what I also want to get at is, um, and maybe this relates to what you just said uh, about Germany still being a majority anti-militaristic society, I would, uh, I would also agree with that. That would certainly reflect my um, experience living here, especially coming from uh, the United States, uh, where the attitude towards the military is decidedly different. But I guess what I want to get at is, um, do you think that the German state can be converted? Like, let's, you know, let's entertain a hypothetical situation in which we have a progressive majority um, uh, in government. Do you think the German state could be used then as a tool for, for example, this kind of uh, civil crisis prevention that you're describing? Can we, can we, uh, can we, can we use the tools from the master's house, so to speak, to to change? Uh, the, the international order. Totally, totally. I mean, there's a fair chance in nine months, in 10 months, that the, uh, that the left party becomes part of the Czech government. Um, I'm not sure whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it might happen that the numbers in the next election, September 2021, will be enough. And then we, I think we will have no choice but to join the government. And I'm pretty sure that we can change a lot. Um, for example, for civil crisis prevention. Um, one of the um, suggestions we make is that the German, instead of sending military soldiers to, to a couple of countries, spending billions of euros there, spend the exact same money on two or three international universities to educate and train um, civil society um, and mediators, whatsoever you need for peaceful transition um, and, and, and violent conflict countries and have these universities and one in Africa, one in Asia, one in South America, educate every year 500 to 1,000 people. So you have a real force of mediators around the world who could do their job in their region. Uh, that would be a long-term thing, really change a lot of things in many countries. I myself have been to South Sudan. And when we were there, just before the civil war broke out in South Sudan, we thought at that very moment to have like 500 or 1,000 people from South Sudan or from the region who would be able to do the mediation on a local level, it could have prevented so much violence and so much death. It would have really changed something. So this is one, one very simple thing, what you could do, what we propose, and I think what we will be easily able to, to, to make happen once we are part of the government. And at the same time, we will never, ever enter a government where they continue to sell weapons uh, uh, weapons of war to other countries. It will not happen. I mean, and, and I know that neither the Green Party nor the Social Democratic Party has arms exports as one of their biggest issues. So I think we can move them quite, quite a lot on that point. And yeah, contentious issues are, are foreign deployment and NATO, but I'm sure there will be solutions. We as the left party will never ever say yes to foreign deployments of German soldiers. 
Grüße. mentioned in the article that you wrote for the Rosa Luxembourg Stiftung, you have mentioned the term, I would say, human security and uh, several times. So um, could you elaborate more on why, what does it mean? And also, why is it a corner stone in the work that you do? <coughs> security is important. <coughs> and the, the, the problem is true, I mean, uh, when we discussed Afghanistan in, in, in the German parliament, all the other people, uh, parties would say, you know, there's this war and you go there to Afghanistan and the only thing the people in Afghanistan want is they want to have it uh, be sated and secure. They want to have enough to eat and they don't want to be um, violated, killed or whatsoever. So sated and secure, as the German saying, is sort of the, the basics of human development. So. In a way, you can't argue with that. I mean, if you are every day under threat that, you know, people come and kill you, um, kill your people, rape you, whatsoever, I mean, there will be no development, nothing. So safe and secure is something that is right. So, but what means security? And I think the, 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 the major German party's understanding of security is military security. So give me a gun, I'm secure. <laughs> And human security is sort of a totally different understanding of, of the term security. And this is not a left intervention. I mean, I talk about it because I like the concept of this, but this concept of human security was debated on the UN level. There's a UN General Assembly resolution, I think from 2012, that talks about human security and, and is really broad in its understanding of what security means. I have it here. Uh, just let me quote uh, two sentences, which I find key. So this General Assembly resolution reads, human security um, is the right of people to live in freedom and dignity. I mean, that's much more than just military. Yeah? To, the right of people to live in freedom and dignity, free from poverty and despair. And for me, is a lefty um, definition, live free from poverty and despair. And it goes on, again, um, UN General Assembly, human security, security equally considers civil, political, economic, social, and cultural, cultural rights. So this is a very broad understanding of security, and I like that. Because it's not enough that the people have enough to eat and have a, a machine pistol under the bed. Um, they also need their dignity. They need um, cultural rights. They need freedom of speech. So all the human rights are part of human security. So and this is, for me, a, a leftist vision also of, of international intervention. If people in Saudi Arabia are deprived of their human rights, I want to intervene, not militarily, <laughs> but I have to find ways to intervene. This is what the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation is all about. You know, We have these offices in, in 25 plus countries or regions. It's about to support these people that are progressive, that, that protect human security in these countries. So this is for me, yeah, the cornerstones, because this is for me what left politics is about. Thanks so much, Jan. Um, we're running out of time, but I did want to talk to you a little bit more about, about German politics. You, um, you already snatched away my last question from me by uh, saying you think Die Linke has a pretty good shot next fall. But I wanted to walk it back a second. Um, obviously, elections are coming up probably early October 2021. Um, and there is a widespread hope, at least among the Social Democrats and Die Linke, you can never quite tell with the German Greens, but in, in the broader progressive camp, I think it's safe to say that there is a pretty strong hope that we will see a red-red-green coalition, a, some kind of soft left co co coalition take power after, it feels like 30 years, but realistically only 15 years of Angela Merkel. And um, uh, there's been a recent controversy in your party, in Die Linke, uh, which uh, you've been a leading member of for quite a while now, um, around something that uh, Gregor Gysi said. Gregor Gysi, obviously, for those who maybe who don't know, a longtime leader of the party, probably the party's most iconic and well-known elder statesman, who recently said um, that he thinks that Die Linke needs to drop its unconditional rejection of NATO um, as a precondition for joining a government. And this is something that's been a major controversy in the party for a very long time, um, as I'm sure you know uh, even better than I do. Um, and I wanted to get your 
first off, maybe just to get your take on, on this debate. Uh, obviously, this is once again um, kind of thrown up the traditional arguments on each side. Uh, you tend to take a more nuanced approach. So I was wondering, what do you think about this kind of, I mean, if, if we were to, you know, in, in Goethe's Faust, I guess you would call it the Gretchen question, how do you stand on NATO? Do you think that this is really such a uh, defining issue for the left? Yes, and I mean, you say it's a controversy, but I think it's not a controversy on contents. It's one on the tactical approach. So let's start at the content. I mean, we have our, uh, how do you call it in English, our program, our program. basic, the program, our basic program, where it is very clear we are against um, military interventions. And we want to replace, and that's now very important, the wording, because uh, all the different factions fought for long for this wording, we want to replace NATO by a system of collective security in Europe, uh, including Russia. So replacing NATO means at the, in the long run, we don't want NATO. And if you read the original um, interview with Gregor Gysi, he did not argue at any point against that one. I think he supports this like most other, there's very few members of the party who would argue with this sentence. It's part of our DNA right now. Now the question is, how do you approach um, possible negotiations for, for a, a coalition on the federal level? Because um, for the Green Party and the Social Democrats, it's sort of a key issue. We are part of NATO, we are part of NATO. And as long as the left party is against NATO, we cannot have a coalition with them. They are saying this for years and years and years, and they can continue to say it. it's all their right. But it's our right to say all the time, we think NATO is wrong. NATO was a maybe historical thing. And, and we can argue and fight along about whether NATO was made sense 40 years ago or not. I was always against it, but I don't care. You know, Cold War is over. This is my message. Cold War is over. It was a military treaty um, for the Cold War. Cold War is over. We don't need NATO any longer. And I can say this. Now, the question is the tactical question. What do you do as an F party now if you want to become member of the coalition government? Do you say in advance, oh, yeah, we want to make a coalition. I don't care about our NATO position. Uh, we drop our NATO position because I want to become a minister. For me, it's tactically just stupid, you know, um, because we have our position, they have their position, we have the election, then we have negotiations, and in the negotiations, they will be forced to concede some points, and we will be forced to concede some points. What is utterly stupid is to concede points before the election. Why would I do that? I mean, at the end of the negotiations, I know how strong we are, how strong they were, and what we can achieve and what not. So, Every talk right now about dropping this or that or that demand is just bad negotiation tactics. On NATO, I think there's no problem at all because we don't say we want to leave NATO tomorrow. We say we want to replace it with a collective cooperative security system in Europe, including Russia. So the first thing you need here is this collective cooperative security system in Europe, and that will take years. I mean, building trust with Russia takes a couple of years. We would start it immediately, but I think we could negotiate something where we say, okay, in four years time, we are at a point where we can ditch NATO. And in these four years, we want to achieve A, B, C, and D in our negotiations with Russia and in Europe to build up such a cooperative security system. That, that's a sensible approach. I would never ever retreat from our position to say uh, we, we, we want to get rid of NATO because it's right to get rid of it. It was 1989 was right to get rid of NATO. It was with the end of the Cold War, I mean, let's say 92, I don't care, but with the end of the Cold War, NATO is outlived. Well, thanks a lot, Jan. I'd love to keep talking to you, especially about the elections and uh, where you see German politics going, but unfortunately we've run out of time. I'd like to thank Jan von Aachen from the D-Linka Executive Board for taking time to speak with us today. I'm Lauren Bellhorn, and with me as always is Fida Alzanin. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at RosaLux underscore global, and feel free to leave us suggestions for future topics or guests uh, here on Facebook or on Twitter and under the hashtag Global Solidarity. We'll be back in two weeks on December 16th talking about the 10th anniversary of the Arab Spring, where it's gone, what we can still expect from it. Uh, until then, take care, and uh, we'll see you soon. <laughs> Try to. <laughs>